So welcome to Math 409, Lecture 17. Uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about the Dearstay box principle today or the pigeonhole principle. How many of you have seen this before? Okay, has everyone seen the standard proof about how you can approximate rationals by irrationals? Can everybody reproduce this? So what I want to do is I want to start off with the standard problem and then go from this to something that you hopefully haven't seen before. So it's not bad to start off with the original. So the box or pigeon principle, you have n plus one pigeons and n box boxes, at least one box gets two pigeons. So this is an extremely obvious observation. You know, if I have a pigeon gun, which of course does not hurt any pigeons, you know, and we shoot the pigeons into boxes and each pigeon has to go into exactly one box. You can't have each box having one or fewer pigeons because that will only come up to n. So at least one box has to have two pigeons. So it turns out that there's a lot of consequences from this. And so the first one is approximating rationals. So theorem, given any irrational number alpha, there exists infinitely many p over q, such that alpha minus p over q is less than one over q squared. Okay. Why do you think I'm saying alpha is irrational? So do you think it would still work if alpha was rational? Uh, let's, let's say relative. If I don't say relatively prime, um, well, actually, this would almost, for, I, I, if I'm saying that there's infinitely many, I can't keep taking the same p over q, but just doubling each and tripling each and quadrupling each because the denominator would be growing. So if I took, say, if, if one half was so good that this was less than one fourth, I can't then take two fourths, three sixths, four eighths because the denominator would be growing and growing and growing. And eventually that would stop. So it's good to say relatively prime, but if I don't have that, because I want infinitely many good approximations, I can't just keep taking the same one again and again and again. So the question is, do we actually need alpha to be irrational? To some extent, it's most useful when alpha is irrational. The goal is to take an irrational number and approximate it by rationals. Why might we want to do that? This is 21st century. Why might we want to approximate things by rationals? Yeah, for calculators and computers. You know, calculators and computers, you know, you can only work with finitely many bits. And so if you're going to do that, you need to be very careful and make sure that you have something that is uh, in the realm that the computer can work on. So it's a really good idea to be able to approximate things very well by rationals. To some extent, if I want to approximate pi to 14 digits, well, I can just write 14 digits after the decimal point and then just do, you know, three, one, four, one, five, blah, 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 and divide by one, zero, zero, and I've got 14 digits. The problem is this is expensive because the denominator is very big. If I want 20 digits or 40 digits or 100 digits, I end up having huge fractions. So when we're trying to measure the quality of an approximation, it's really not that impressive to approximate a number well with a very large denominator. Is it hard to approximate any irrational within one over a hundred? So with our loss of generality, all of our numbers live in the interval zero one. So let's say I give you an irrational number in zero one. Is it hard to find a rational that's within one over a hundred of it? So how can we find a rational within one over a hundred 
of an irrational number in zero one. Give me a constructive procedure. Yeah, chop it into a hundred bits. You know, and look from you know, look at zero, one over a hundred, two over a hundred, three over a hundred, four over a hundred. If I keep walking in steps of one over a hundred, I'm going to eventually go from you know before it to after it. So I have to be within one over a hundred. So it's really not that hard to approximate any number to within one over q. Right? One over q is not impressive. It's just walk. One over q squared, that's impressive. That means you know, if you know, my if q is 100, then this is 1 over 100 squared. That's, that's something that's non-trivial. OK, and so the proof is, so the proof is as follows. So fix a big Q, look at, say, alpha, 2 alpha, 3 alpha, dot, 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 Q plus 1 alpha mod 1. So I look at the fractional parts. Two of them have to lie in the same interval of length one over big Q. Why? So, I have Q plus one. So what am I using? Yeah, not surprisingly, you know, I'm using the pigeonhole principle. If I have Q plus one objects, you always have to figure out when I'm doing the pigeonhole principle, what are the boxes, what are the pigeons? So by box principle, at least two in an interval, say one, let's do, you know, K over Q, K plus one over Q. Okay. So maybe we would have um, A1 alpha minus P1, uh, maybe I'll do Q1, minus Q2 alpha, minus P2 is less than one over Q. Okay. And what am I doing? Well, if I look at the, the fractional parts, I have to subtract an integer. So let's let P1 be the integer I have to subtract from Q1 alpha so that it's now a number in zero one. And let's let P2 be the integer I have to subtract from Q2 alpha so that it's in the interval zero one. Now, if I look at their difference, the difference has to be now less than one over Q because they're in the same subinterval. Is it possible that it might be exactly equal to one over Q? What would it mean if the difference was exactly one over Q? Yeah. Alpha would have to be rational. So if you go through it, you would then get um, if you just do the algebra, you would get alpha is rational. Alpha is irrational. So to not be less than or equal to. And so if we look at this now, what do we get? We now get alpha minus P over Q is less than one over QQ, where Q is Q1 minus Q2. And P is, I think, P1 minus P2. You just divide both sides by Q. And so I get alpha minus P over Q is less than one over little Q times big Q. Everybody comfortable with this? But what do we know about the relationship between little Q and big Q? I'm sorry? Less than Q or at most? At most, right? Because we know Q1 and Q2 range from one to Q plus one. So their difference is at most Q. So this is less than or equal to one over little Q squared as Q is less than or equal to big Q. So one over big Q is less than or equal to one over Q, right? And so that proves that there's at least one fraction that we can do. We wanted to prove that there are infinitely many. So how do you get, this is the one subtle point. How do you get that there are infinitely many? 
The danger, of course, is that as you do this again and again and again, maybe you keep getting the same little cue, right? So you have to now show me how do we know we keep getting different P's and Q's? Was this point covered when you did this proof the first time? This is a subtle point that has to be covered. Yeah, but you would just keep increasing big Q. Good. You keep increasing big Q. We know, so we, so we know alpha minus P over Q is less than one over big Q, right? So if big Q is really, really big, cannot be the same P over Q as before, right? Because whatever P over Q you have, there's some finite distance between that and alpha. So if we have alpha here, and we have maybe our P over Q over here, we've got some distance now. So choose Q less than one half alpha minus P over Q. Um, one over Q to be less than that, right? And so if I choose Q to be sufficiently large, there's no way I can be getting the same P over Q as before. And so when I keep choosing my string of Qs, I will be getting different fractions P over Q. It turns out that there's a beautiful theory of how you find these P over Qs. If you know continued fractions, they allow you to generate these very nicely. All right, any questions about the standard pigeonhole Dirichlet's problem? How many people covered the subtle point when they first saw this, that you don't keep getting the same P over Q? So you've got to be really careful when you do these arguments. Okay. There's a lot of ways we can go. One way is to turn this into a number theory class, which we won't do. And we can then ask, what is the most irrational of all irrational numbers? And you have to ask yourself, well, what do you mean by irrational? What do you mean by the most irrational? What metric are we using? So a really good metric would be to think, well, I know from this theorem that I can approximate any irrational by infinitely many p over q so that the error is at most one over q squared. But maybe I can do better. Maybe I can get one over q cubed or one over q to the fourth. The smaller the error for a given denominator, the better job I'm doing. And so the question is, which irrationals have really small errors for given denominators? Or conversely, which rationals have really large ones? You can't do, you can always do at least as well as one over q squared. With a little bit more work, you can do, I think, one over Q squared root five. And that might give you an idea of which is the most irrational of all irrationals. When you hear root five, what do you think of? Golden ratio. I, I don't remember if I've mentioned this in this class, but years ago, the record asked a bunch of math professors, you know, what's your favorite number and why? And with a straight face, I said the golden mean, because among its many wonderful properties, it's the inverse of its own reciprocal. How many numbers are the inverse of their own reciprocal? Every number does not zero. Every, every non-zero number. But if you say things for the straight face, and so I just said it with a straight face, and I actually, I've, I've gotten professional mathematicians with that as well. They've started to do the calculation of the golden mean and then hit me. Um, so anyways, the golden mean is the hardest irrational to approximate by rationals. It's the one that has the biggest error. And if you know continued fractions, it's because all of the digits are one, the larger the digit in the continued fraction expansion, the better the approximation is. All right, we're not gonna go that route. Um, if people are interested, we can start talking about how well can you approximate general numbers. So I'll let you email me if you want to see more on this. You know, how well can you approximate different types of numbers? Wonderful theory behind this. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about what would happen if we had a rational number? Do you think we can get infinitely many 
P over Q so that if alpha is rational, say alpha is A over B, do you think we can find infinitely many P over Q so that this is less than one over Q squared? Or do you think we can't do that for rationals? So a lot of things have a fundamentally different behavior if your number is rational or irrational, or a fundamentally different behavior depending on what type of irrational are you. Are you an algebraic number? Does that, that means do you solve a polynomial with integer coefficients and finite degree, or are you a transcendental number? All right. What I want to do is I want to try to do something that you hopefully have not seen before. You've seen simultaneous approximations. Well, actually, it's not going to be a question mark because we are doing it. So given alpha one, alpha two, irrational, find P over Q such that alpha I minus P over Q is less than one over F of Q for some good function F. Do you think this should be possible? Or do you think I need to modify the problem a little bit? So can I find one fraction that does a good job approximating both? Yeah, well, one of the that if they're not equal, this does not make sense. Okay, why not? Uh, because, um, well, maybe I know the quality of the uh, over here close to both. Then... Right, yeah. right. If I have two numbers that are separated, I'm not going to be able to find one fraction that's good for both of them. So I have to weaken this. So there's no way I can do P over Q. What do you think I can try to do? So I can't have the same fraction. I over Q. Yeah, P I over Q. And so again, one of the things I really want you to get out of this class is how to think about problems. What would be a good problem to study? The first most natural generalization is, well, can I simultaneously approximate two irrationals with the same rational? No, right? Your know, limits are unique. If I have two different numbers, I can't be close to both of them. Okay, well, what if I want to use the same denominator? Can I find a denominator that gives me two good approximations? And I'm allowing my numerators to be different. This is more reasonable. Do you think, can you give me any thoughts about f of q? So how many of you have ever seen this problem before? Good. So we've started with something you've seen before, and now we have something completely new. What can you tell me about f of q? Obviously, the larger f of q is, the better the approximation. Can anybody give me any thoughts about f of q? Good. So the first is a lower bound. We can clearly do this because we can just move in steps of size one over Q. So that's not a big deal. Okay, so given the success on the lower bound, let's do an upper bound. And you may, it may not be something that you can prove right now, but maybe just your intuition. Any intuition on an upper bound? Possibly not as good as the single approximation. Good, it probably shouldn't be as good as the one dimensional case. If I'm trying to approximate two things, well, <laughs> it's really hard to approximate one thing, but if I have to approximate two things, I'm gonna be able to do better. If that were the case, what could you do if you want to approximate one thing? Just choose anything else, right? So it seems like it shouldn't be able to beat the one dimensional case. Shouldn't beat the one dimensional case. Now it's possible that the argument we did in the one dimensional case was not optimal. So initially we had, 
you can clearly get a one over Q by just taking steps of size Q. And then by using the box principle, we've got you could do one over Q squared. Maybe we could do an even better argument and get one over Q cubed. And so maybe we'll, when we try to do simultaneous approximations, maybe the fact that we're trying to do two might force us to do something different and get a better result because we're thinking about the problem in a better way. So the worst rejection I ever received for a paper was, um, you know, I was writing with a young colleague of mine and we proved there was a conjecture that went down to square root cancellation. And we actually proved beyond square root cancellation. And the referee wrote, why would you want to prove more than this conjecture? And we were just an absolute shock at receiving this. And I wrote to the editor, do you want us to rewrite the paper with weaker results? And say, instead of doing the following clever argument, we instead just bound things naively? The editor said they get so many papers, they don't have time to go back to the referee. They don't have time to get another referee. It is the last time I've ever submitted a paper to that journal. I have refereed papers for that journal because I know young people have been submitting papers. It's a strong journal. I don't want to hurt their career. And so I have still taken referee requests, but I will not send any papers to this journal. This was a referee report of somebody who just did not want to read the paper. They were busy and rather than just saying no, they came up with an absurd excuse. I'm rejecting the paper because it proves too much. But when you're trying to think about these things, it is very easy to have these blinders on. And when you see certain types of problems, you think this is how I should attack this problem. And there might be a better way of doing it. And so when you're trying to figure out what's reasonable, it is reasonable to say FQ should be less than equal to Q squared because we shouldn't be able to do better than we're doing in the one dimensional case. But maybe the one dimensional case, we weren't arguing it the right way. What do you think the next generalization would be after this? So the next generalization, so we initially did given some alpha, now we have alpha one and alpha two. What do you think is next? Yeah. And so if have say alpha one, alpha say k that are irrational, we want alpha i minus pi over q to be less than one over, let's call it f sub k of q. What is the upper bound um, let's say dependence on K? If you increase K, what do you think is going to happen to FK? Again, it's okay if you're not right, just Yes, what do you think would happen to the quality of our bounds as we try to approximate more and more things simultaneously with the same denominator? It's probably going to get worse. You know, if you look at pi, there are certain fractions that do a wonderful job of approximating pi. Uh, does anybody know the Buffon needle problem? So if you have a grid of parallel lines with the same separation, you throw some rods, you can ask how many times do the rods intersect the lines? And it turns out that the answer is a rational multiple of pi. The rational multiple depends on the gaps between the parallel lines and the thickness of the rods. There's a beautiful way to do this without actually doing any calculations by just bending the rods into a circle. When I was an undergraduate at Yale, I was president of the math club and I convinced my probability teacher to give a talk. And he said, I can talk about anything I want and you'll take charge of all the setup and all the cleanup, yes. So he did Buffon's needle and he actually threw pasta up in the air and had it land on the ground. And he said, and you know, since I'm not the one who has to clean up, let's see if it's different if you use wet pasta. And he actually got the pasta to stick to the ceiling. I, yeah, I had to take my hat off to him for that one. You know, beautifully done, okay. Now, there was somebody who claimed to have done this and got pi to, I think, eight digits. And what somebody notices, interestingly, the number 
of Rod's throne happen to be exactly the denominator you need for a good rational approximation for pi. It's almost as if he was deliberately making up numbers. So when you have something like this, you really want to think about what does your intuition say? If I take more and more terms, I would expect FQ would be getting smaller as K gets larger. I still think it's got to be at least Q. But then the question is, maybe what is the dependence? And so we could try to do the problem in general, or we can do it in two dimensions and then try to generalize. I think it's better to just do it in two dimensions, do it explicitly, build intuition, and then I'll leave as an exercise if you're interested to try to think how would it extend in higher dimensions. Right. Any thoughts? So proof. So we have you know alpha one, alpha two are not rational. And we want to find P1 over Q, P2 over Q. Any thoughts of what we should do? So think about the one dimensional case. How can we use the one dimensional case to our advantage? So what, what, okay, so we need a big Q. Now when you're doing, what method do you think is gonna be useful for this? Pigeonhole principle, given that this is the lecture on the pigeonhole principle and we use the pigeonhole in the one dimensional case, probably gonna be a pigeonhole principle here. When you're doing a pigeonhole principle, you need two objects, the boxes, and the pigeons. So what do you think the pigeons are? What were the pigeons in one dimension? Multiples of alpha. So what do you think the pigeons are going to be here? Yeah, so maybe it would be Alpha one, where is each other? Alpha two. What do you think my next pigeon will be? Two alpha one, two alpha two, up to some number. And then I will put a question mark because we don't yet know what number it is. I have a guess. So we have our pigeons. So our pigeons are going to be points, and we're going to all look at these mod one, and the same as before. All right, does this help you figure out what the boxes might be? Kind of like the unit square separated into grids. Of yeah. One over two. Yeah. So let's take our unit square. And this is supposed to represent just you know choosing lots of boxes. So here is zero, zero, here's one, one, and these thicknesses are one over Q, one over Q. So how many, so these are the boxes. So again, when you have the ability to come up with a algorithm or procedure to do something, you're much more likely to get the right answer. You know, quadratic formula, it is not hard to solve a quadratic. You give me any quadratic, I identify A, B, C, and then I plug them into negative B plus or minus. When you're doing a pigeonhole principle, you have to identify the pigeons in the boxes. So just explicitly write down, here's my pigeons, here's my boxes. So this would be like uh, maybe A over Q, um, A plus one over Q, uh, sorry. So the, the box would be something like this. Here's A over Q, B over Q. And then this would be A plus one over Q, B plus one over Q. Those would be the different boxes. 
So what do you think, how many pigeons do we need? Yeah, so question mark is Q squared plus one. That's how many pigeons we need. And so what can we deduce if we have this many pigeons? Two of them are in the same box. So two in the same box. So what does that mean? So let's just write things you know, very slowly. So we would have maybe um, let's do A1 alpha, A1, alpha one, A1, alpha two, and maybe A2 alpha one, A2 alpha two in the same box, right? So what does it mean to be in the same box? It means A1 alpha one minus P11 minus A2 alpha one minus its integer uh, P12 has to be how big? One over big Q or little Q? Big Q. I mean, right now we don't actually have a little Q. So when you say Q, it is understood that it is big Q. And so we would similarly have um, A1 alpha two minus P21 minus A2 alpha two minus P22 is less than one over big Q. So from the first, what do we get? We would get alpha one minus P1 over Q is less than one over little Q, big Q, I think. And alpha two minus P2 over Q is less than one over Q, Q. Here, little Q is going to be A1 minus A2, which is gonna be less than or equal to big Q. Uh, P1, I think is going to be, it's related to P11 minus P12, dot, dot, dot. I don't wanna worry about plus signs and minus signs, and you don't want me to worry about plus signs and minus signs. We're all on the same page here. Wait, isn't that uh, capital Q squared? Like little Q equals- Oh yes, it's less than equal to capital Q squared, thank you, yes. Okay. So we know Q is less than equal to Q squared. So one over Q squared is less than equal to one over Q or one over big Q is less than equal to one over Q to the one half. Yes. Therefore, we get alpha I minus PI over Q is less than one over Q to the three halves. Is this reasonable? We can write this as one over, you know, Q, Q to the one half. The advantage of writing it like that is the one over Q is the trivial part. You know, I've got to be able to do at least as well as one over Q or I don't deserve to be standing at the front of the classroom, right? Because I can just walk in steps of size one over Q. I can't help but be within one over Q. The extra factor of one over square root of Q is telling us how much better we can do. And so note, it's one over Q to the one half versus one over Q from one dimension. So it's worse. You know, one over Q to the one half is much greater than one over Q if Q is large, right? Okay, conjecture. If we have alpha one to alpha K, then alpha I minus PI over Q less than one over 
Here's the what. K plus one over K, one plus one over K. It was one over Q, Q to the one over K. So why is that your conjecture? Okay, so you are making a conjecture based on one data point. Ah, oh, good, we have two data points. So I was gonna say, you could go into marketing. <laughs> Why do we have two data points? Well, because if you only have one, then it's Q times Q to the one over one. Good, we know that this also works. And if we take the special case when alpha one equals alpha two, then we only have to take a big Q over here. We actually have two data points. Right. So you can be a quant person now, right? So we have enough so that one plus one over K seems a very reasonable conjecture. And looking at the proof, it seems like I would just have a system of you know, K inequalities like this, the Q squared would become Q to the K. And so the, the proof is basically just writing itself. Okay, so hopefully no one has seen this before and that this is something new. This is something that could easily have been done when you were doing the original Dirichlet problem, you know, simultaneous approximations. This does not mean that this is the best you can do. It just means if you're going to use the box principle and you want to just naively apply it in general. So what would be a natural question to ask? So we have this result. So one is how does it connect? You know, what can we use this for? You know, why is this useful? And it does turn out for certain things, you know, especially if you do some things in physics, knowing how irrational something is does influence dynamical behavior. But what we've just shown is that if we have two numbers and we want to simultaneously approximate them well with the same denominator, if we use the pigeonhole principle, we get one over Q to the three halves. What do you think you might want to ask? Yeah, is there another way that's better? You know, maybe this is just not the best way to do it. Um, have we done Horner's algorithm in this class to evaluate polynomials? Okay, so maybe later in the semester we'll talk about, there's a lot of mathematics where you've been taught how to do things and they work, but they're not the most efficient way to do things. So just because you've been doing something does not mean it's the best way to do it. It could be that there is a completely different approach so one question you might ask is, is it possible to find two irrational numbers where you cannot do better than one over two to the three halves? So I'll make that extra good. I have no idea if that's known or not. And when I say better than one over two to the three halves, you can put whatever constant you want. You can do like one over a thousand, whatever. I, I don't really care. I care about the Q dependence, not the constant. So is it possible to find two irrationals that it's just hard to approximate well simultaneously, that you can't do better than Q to the three halves. It's often interesting in mathematics, when are we able to prove that you can't do something better? We saw an example of this with the Conway soldiers or the Conway checker problem, where we proved that you can't do a checker moving up five units in a finite amount of time. I, I love proofs like this where you can often prove you can either do something non-constructively or you can prove no matter what construction you try, it won't work. So here, try to see how far you can push this. You know, is it possible to have two numbers that just can't be well approximated? As an aside, how many of you have seen the Euclidean algorithm? So it turns out Euclidean algorithm is extremely important. Uh, two of my colleagues, professors, Gaudi and Adams have math debates. And one of them was Gaudi supporting the Euclidean algorithm. Does anybody know what Professor Adams supported? Is it, was it about the boundary between algorithms or something? Like that? Well, he, he, there was some um, Euclidean algorithm, I think it was versus maybe it might've been the trefoil knot or something from knot theory. Doesn't really matter. It's hard to beat the Euclidean algorithm. You know, Professor Adams gave a valued attempt but the Euclidean algorithm is just incredibly important. 
So much of modern encryption comes from this. Uh, how many of you have done abstract algebra? So when you're trying to prove you know, certain sets are actually groups and you need to find inverses, Euclidean algorithm you know, shows up there. So the Euclidean algorithm initially could take a long time to run. It actually runs in logarithmic time. So if you have two numbers, x less than equal to y, the number of steps you need before the Euclidean algorithm terminates is on the order of log x. Does anybody know which pairs of numbers are the worst to use the Euclidean algorithm on? Fibonacci. Fibonacci's. The Fibonacci's take the longest runtime. So if I give you two numbers, x and y, you might as well assume x is less than y is less than twice x. Because if you just make y really, really large, well, okay, I can just normalize a little bit. So to be fair, if you take two numbers where you know, one is less than double the other, uh, the worst case is when you take two Fibonacci's. It's going to take the longest for the Euclidean algorithm to run. All right. So I actually did a really good job of guessing how many pages it would take to do all of the you know, box principles. So here's a couple of problems that I just uh, have collected over the years. You know, these are extremely standard. Um, you know, we have time, I think, to do you know, one of them. Um, so it's, yeah, I, the ones that just jump up to my mind, is I like A45, given a finite set of n integers, prove there's a subset whose sum is divisible by n. Um, I like A43, if we choose 55 numbers from the set, one to 100, then among the chosen numbers, there are two whose difference is 10. Uh, A42 isn't bad. If we choose a subset from one to two n with at least n plus one elements, then it contains at least two elements, A and B with A divides B. What do you think is going to be useful for these problems? Pigeonhole principle, right? And what do we need to do if we are going to do the pigeonhole principle? Determine the pigeons and determine the boxes. So as a professor, I would vote for either 4.2, 4.3, or 4.5. 4.5. So life, the first loud voice wins. And so since you spoke first, let's see if this works. I, okay, so I don't quite think, okay, so it doesn't work because that's text. Okay, so this is, we have a set of integers. Okay. So A45, we have A1, A2, dot, 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 AN. Prove a, I think a subset has a sum divisible by N. Yes. Prove a subset has a sum that is divisible by N. So we have to figure out what are the pigeons and what are the boxes? Any thoughts? Yes. I think I'm thinking of a sub one, a sub one plus a sub two, a sub one plus a sub one, a sub three, and so on. And we can assume that they all have different vertices. Sorry, is that okay? And so, so if we keep doing this. We get up to a one plus a two plus a three plus dot 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 plus a n. So how many pigeons do we have? N, n pigeons. So again, so we can look at these. We can look at these mod n. So mod n, mod n, mod n, mod n. How many possible subsets are there from the numbers A1 through AN? Two to the n, maybe minus one. Two to the n minus one. You know, I have to choose something, right? So there's a tremendous number of subsets that you can choose. You are choosing a very special subset. Okay. So if we have n pigeons, how many boxes do we have? Well, can you tell me about the number of boxes? I'm sorry. Well, we haven't said what the boxes are. How many boxes do I have to have? So, you know, at most n boxes. So let's choose the residues 
one, two, three, dot, 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 n minus one. So n minus one boxes. And the advantage is if one of these sums on the left was a multiple of n, we'd be done, right? So that's how we can get rid of one box. Without loss of generality, all sums are non-zero mod n, else we're done. So by the box principle, two are the same mod n. So what does it mean if two of them are the same mod n? The difference is divisible by n. So difference is divisible by n. And what's the difference? A subset. So it would be, you know, maybe a k plus a k plus one plus dot 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 plus a l. And now we have a and that that meets the needs. Okay. So when you see a problem like this, you want to analyze your method of proof and see, did you do a good job or a wasteful job? This seems exceptionally wasteful, right? We have two to the n minus one non-empty subsets using only n. So do you think that we need to have n elements to have a sum that's a multiple of n, or do you think we could do it with fewer? So all the entries are one. Ah. So the, so the natural question, if we have a one, a two, dot, 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 a n minus one, must a subset be a multiple of n? And the answer, as you just said, is no, consider one, well, I want the numbers to be distinct. You can fix it very easily. Yeah, n plus one. Two n plus one, plus one dot, dot, dot. And what's the last one? I think it's n minus one times n plus one, or is it n minus two? The first one is zero, so it'd be n minus n. Okay. And so this gives me a distinct set. So it turns out that you can't actually do it with fewer than n terms. You have to have n terms. So the proof, which seemed extremely wasteful at first, turns out it really isn't. So, you know, it's a little bit of a surprising result. All right, so again, we can easily spend a lot more time on the pigeonhole principle. This is a senior seminar. If there are things you want to do in greater detail, email me. Otherwise, the goal is just, you know, I'm going to keep you know, throwing in things that I think are interesting. They will try to relate to things you've seen before, such as the one over Q, but try to push it a little bit further to things you might not have seen. All right, so this is a good place to stop. stop.